This talk is about interprocess communication. It is one of a series of talks that we have put on. They are videoed, and if you are um, on the lam from someone, you should make sure to stay out of the range of the cameras. The videos and the associated slides wind up on our website, and this one will too, in due course, they'll get there. Um, in fact, in order to cover the subject of interprocess communication, I have to review some things lightly that were covered in considerable depth in prior talks. Um, some questions I will uh, refer to say, well, this is all covered in such and such a talk. Um, but in general, if you find th what uh, the topic and uh, what I'm saying of interest, uh, taking a look through some of these that are on the site will uh, probably whet your interest. The m hmm? ah, this is for, for the, the audience. Is that any better? Testing one, two, three, four, sound check. Okay, we can do it this way too. So long as I have two hands, because I need to be able to operate the, the slides as well. The mill is a new CPU architecture. There's been essentially zero development in machine architecture since the risk um, development and in hardware terms since the development of caches. There's been a lot of evolutionary advances, but nothing much has really changed. Um, that's a long time period, and the mill reflects a, uh, from scratch, rethink of exactly what a CPU should do. And one of the things it should do is be able to be sold. And this means that in practice it has to be able to run conventional programs run, written in conventional languages without rewrite. And it has to have enough of an advantage over, over existing chips and existing architectures that people will be interested in buying it. We believe we have this in the mill. There's a 10x um, advantage over existing architectures in the uh, area cross product, cross performance. And um, one of the things that we'll be touching on tonight is how, how where that 10x comes from in uh, the particular case of interprocess communication. Um, we'll cover, in particular, um, symmetric distrust and asymmetric distrust and how protection works when both sides are paranoid. Um, we will, uh, part of the um, advantage that Mill has is that we do not have to do translation when data is being passed back and forth across interprocess communication. And uh, still the data can be passed in a way that is secure from both sides. However, individual OSs have features that make um, doing things better significantly difficult. And with this being a Unix group, I've picked one of the Unix features that uh, raises difficulties and uh, explained a little bit about why it's a troublesome and what we had to do about it. The instruction set architecture it's a wide issue machine in the way that a VLIW or a uh, EPIC machine are wide issues. Every cycle, depending on the family member, it's a family like the 360 is a family. The high ends can issue as many as 30 independent operations every cycle. That is not SIMD, that's not vector, uh, each element of a vector or each, uh, uh, instead, these are individual operations. One is an add, one's a subtract, one's a branch, what have you, um, done simultaneously. It's statically scheduled. There's no out of order. There's also no issue hazards, but that's a different problem. And there, it is an exposed pipeline machine, so all ops have a fixed latency, which permits the compiler to produce optimal schedules for the actual code, which is present. Yes. Um, the vectors are integrated. Every operation is simultaneously a scalar operation and a vector operation. And for those of you who have compiler backgrounds, people with compiler background worked on a compiler, 
I, I, only a couple here. Um, I, I'm a compiler guy primarily. I've worked on a dozen of them at the, the various targets and what have you. Static single assignment is the way that modern compilers work. Uh, 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 GCC, um, LLVM, and it essentially uh, means that values can be created but never overwritten. We do the same thing in the hardware. Values can be created but you cannot modify them once created, which means we don't have general registers that you can write to. Now, the topic is fairly complex and there are details for which a specialist will be aware of that for a general audience I cannot go into. Um, I, we try and convey an intuitive understanding of the subject matter. If you want to go in in depth, we're here, we'll answer the questions, we'll go into as much depth as you, as you please. Um, but the slides and the talk itself will try and provide an understanding rather than the kind of details that you'd see in an academic paper. We try not to oversimplify, but sometimes. The talk is also based primarily on mechanism as opposed to policy. The actual environment that you as a user of Unix or any other computer environment um, deal with it reflects a great deal of policy issues. Things are thought that they should be done this way and both the software and hardware are organized to impose that. Um, the talk here is primarily about what the actual hardware does underneath that permits the um, uh, 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 permits the policy to be implemented. So uh, as a result, the, the mill is, should not be described as a Unix machine, or, nor is it, for example, a Windows machine. And it's not dedicated to a particular programming language, so it's not a C machine or a you name it machine. Instead, it's a platform which is, has to provide adequate support for any of these, Unix, Windows, what have you, C, Lisp, what have you. Um, so as a general purpose chip, um, it is essentially in the same space as x86 or ARM chips are. Um, it, you can run it on a laptop, a supercomputer, anything when, uh, where one of those chips would be used. Of course, not all environments have a, a clear policies and models, so um, we, the way the hardware works suggests policies and models if you wish to use them, but does not impose them. Uh, for a motivating example for the way we, what we do with interprocess communication, um, the classic problem for exploits and for system reliability are buggy drivers. Um, they, when the driver has been bound into the operating system and has the operating system bring zero privileges, then you're asking for disaster, a disaster that many of us have met. Um, we believe that a better design is to have the drivers isolated essentially in their own process except the, so that they do not have access to OS or application state. The problem with, of course, with that is that we now have introduced interprocess communication between the application and the driver. Um, the uh, uh, relevant device-specific areas of memory should be mapped into the driver. So if this is your basic pipe, we would recommend, and the Mills architecture in supports but does not impose, that the application is running in its own environment, indicated by the dotted oval. The OS is as well, and the driver and the associated devices are, have their own environment. Consequently, the application can pass data to the OS, the OS can pass it to the driver, and in due course it goes to the device, and probably the device responds, and we wind up having daisy chaining back along. This produces a very nice, clean um, software environment inside the operating system application environment. The problem is, is that um, all the extra uh, interprocess communications make this too expensive in practice. Um, 
different motivating example. A browser downloads and decodes images, so uh, typically the uh, decoders are written in unreliable languages and they're full of vulnerabilities. So th the better approach would be for each image to be decoded in its own process, isolating it from the driver. And so what we really <coughs> want is one process for the browser and one process for the decoder. And then data can be passed from the browser to the decoder and back um, without the decoder, and which may have been perverted by some information in the, in the um, in the image being decoded, uh, being able to access it and uh, get into and pervert the browser. Again, clean and simple, too expensive. So the basic philosophy here is that um, absent of security is the bane of current architectures and in order for security to be improved, it has to have three qualities. It must be unobtrusive. You must not get in your face and cause you to, to um, uh, have to uh, tie yourself in knots in order to use it. It must be unavoidable, so you can't avoid it by accident by forgetting to put it in. And it has to be cheap or it won't be used. In addition, all different aspects and parts of the system should all have equal security and none should be more equal than the others. Uh, those of you who are familiar with George Orwell's Animal Farm will recognize that this implies that there's no pigs on this farm. Um, unfortunately, this directly conflicts with the way Unix and many other operating systems typically are implemented where there is one party, namely the operating system, who has access to control to absolutely anything and uh, is definitely more equal than the other parts. The mill protection model is real simple. You can only see the things I give you. I can only see the things you give me explicitly. No implicit visibility. And it has to be fast and cheap and no third parties involved in order to mediate things because the third parties are op open an avenue for exploits. The image decoder is an example. The browser needs to decode an image. And typically, uh, the, uh, the browser will call the decoder as a function coming out of a library. However, if there is a vulnerability, you've just lost everything and your browser is gone. What we do need to do is to sandbox it by moving the decoder not as a callable library but off as a processor to its own right. And then you're now protected because there is hardware enforcement uh, separation between the two. And the data has to be copied back and forth by the kernel, or you use shared memory, which has its own drawbacks. If this process were cheap on a conventional machine, people would already be doing it instead of suffering through the problems that currently have. The solution, of course, is to get the kernel and the copies out of there so that the browser can, in fact, talk directly to the decoder safely. The way that is done, I'm going to back up a bit and explain how IPCs are conventionally done now um, and then show you how it's different for if you're adopting the mill model. Threads always need to get work done they don't know how to do using their own data. And the standard solution is you call a function from a library, which embeds the how to do it. In this case, what we have is a cooking library, and what you needed was the mix function. And you call it, and there you are. However, sometimes the function maintain, is maintaining persistent state that 
belongs to it. The, function, the library itself has data. Um, thus, for example, it may contain session information of all the people that it's talking about, or it may contain logging information, which, um, all of which needs to survive the individual call. Under those circumstances, it does not want your fingers in its data. And a service, in our terminology, is a hunk of private data that exports an API to manipulate that data. So in this case, the service must be private. The service's data must be private. We need a wall separating it from the client. But now we can't call across the wall because the API is over on the far side that we cannot reach. So we have to move the API onto our side of the wall so that we can call it. But of course now the API can't reach its own data because there's the wall between it and its own data. So we need something to carry the data across the wall and that will be the operating system. It, what happens is you call the operating system saying here's a buffer full of stuff, pass it to him. You're never actually talking to a different process. You always are going through an intermediate which does address translation and a bunch of other things. And that's how conventional IPC works. Your app gives the data to the OS, who goes over the wall and gives it to the server. And in turn, back and forth, and back and forth, and it winds up being fabulously expensive. On a mill, there's no thread or process on the other side of the wall. So that process guy that says security isn't there, there's just the private data. The OS is not involved. There's orders of magnitude less overhead. And whereas it used to be fabulously expensive, it's now cheap enough to use. This is the client terminology here. These are portals. These are API entry points that say, oh, when you call this, I need to be operating on the other side of the wall. This is the permission hardware supported by, their, by the architecture. And this is the service that is separate from and does not have access to the client stuff except what the client gives it. Of course, now we don't have anybody doing the work. There's no server on the far side, there's no server thread on the far side or server process on the far side. Somebody has to do it. And the way that works is that the client thread, that's the application over there, goes through the portal and becomes the server thread itself. So mix, the function, is actually called as on the server side of the security. And then it is able to access the services data this is a portal call. In other words, it's the same thread, but now wearing different clothes. In machine terms, the client thread becomes a server thread. And another way of saying that is that thread running in the client protection environment becomes the thread running in the server protection environment. A turf is a protection environment. There's the client turfs. There's a surface turf. And when the call happens, the client cannot ac access data when it's running as a service. And the ser when it's running as a service, it cannot access the data which is located in the client except what has been explicitly passed to it. The way you tell it that you are, have data that you are permitted to use, 
or through permissions. They're kept in, in tables in memory and cached by the hardware. Each permission has a, describes a range. These are not page tables. These are byte ranges from lower bound to upper bound. So if that's the overall address space and the red box there is some data object, say a buffer in, in the address space, there, one of the things in the partitions uh, is the lower bound and upper bound of the described area. In addition, there are associated rights. These are familiar, they read, write, and execute. There are a few others that you probably won't have seen. And that winds up being all being put into the permission. A turf is a bundle of such permissions with an ID associated with it. They are not the same as access control lists, but in some ways are similar in that you can collect a bunch of uh, permission descriptors together and name them. Permissions could overlap. TERFs is what you're mostly dealing with. It's a collection of memory permissions. They can be code, they can be data, they can be portals. The TERF is a mill concept. They're orthogonal to threads. A process, as in Unix processes, is the combination of a turf and one or more threads. That it is a protection environment and one or more threads that are operating in that protection environment. Whereas all protection environments necessarily have a thread attached in the process model, in the mill you can have a protection environment that has no threads attached but will nevertheless still contain data or may contain data. Now well, you can organize things as a groups of TERFs based on who needs to talk and see what, and in particular the entire OS can be so organized. This approach is the fundamental approach called microkernels in which each need, each need to know region has its own TERF and has its own small piece and they each treat each other as clients and servers. In particular, the device drivers winding up being offices of servers. Browsers simply can be, can be uh, broken up into pieces. And when a thread needs to change its protection environment, it makes a portal call and it's now running at a different turf with a different set of permissions. What about the OS? In this model, the OS is just another application. The mill architecture is designed to support this. The application, like any other, the hardware has no privileged operations at all. Any application can execute any operation. There's no supervisor mode of any kind. And all protection is by memory address, using the protection descriptors that I just saw a couple of slides ago. And I emphasize those, those bounds are byte addresses. If you have an MMIO register that's one byte long, you can give access to that one single one byte register um, that, uh, to a turf, and um, th the program that's running in that turf can access that single byte and not touch the adjacent bytes or uh, any other thing that it hasn't been given. If we split the kernel in, in many turfs to isolate the drivers, we could, might, for example, sandbox the, the um, web server. And it could keep its private keys in a separate turf and then use a key manager service in order to be able to access them. Call and return operations are required in order to make all of this work. And in particular, the mill is a very CISC a complex uh, instruction set architecture. It's very much not risk-like. Um, and in particular, the call and return operations do everything involved in the call, saving state, restoring state, um, checking that permissions are possible, etc. cetera. Um, and the call and return operations are atomic. There are various flavors of them. Um, 
and for in actual use in assembly language code or coming out of a compiler, they look fairly normal. You know, it takes an argument saying how many results you expect and uh, what the address is, just like anything else, and all the list of the arguments to be passed. And the return uh, basically unwinds everything and gives you back zero or more, potentially more than one result as a response. Portals work essentially the same way except that when it does it it goes through and when uh, the call when it arrives at the callee it's now running in a different turf than it was for the caller you get call arguments that work normally this means that ipc is very fast in particular, a portal call is of the same order of overhead as a normal function call. Um, that you know, switching the turf basically involves setting one register as we go through, and that's it. Uh, otherwise, it's essentially the same as an indirect function call would be on the, the basic hardware. The OS is not involved. The portal is just like any other code address, except that it does not have execute permissions. Instead, it has portal permissions. So when you attempt to subroutine call a particular address, we go out to check to see, oh, can I, can, is this address in your address space? Uh, do you have execute for it? And we, the hardware uh, looks and sees and says, oops, you don't have execute permissions for this. This is a portal. And uh, you will then proceed to go through the portal and the portal itself is a descriptor that contains the new turf and the actual address of the code that you're supposed to call. So there's an indirection step here. Indirection is a wonderful thing for everyone. Um, and we will now wind up getting a new stack frame in, like in, in the normal way using the actual address, but meanwhile having changed the turf. So, if we were calling from turf A, the new stack frame will be in turf B. The, the protection prevents people in, running in turf A from accessing the frame which is in stack B, in turf B, and vice versa. The way that works, in order to be able to protect portions of your stack, is the data stack is, as always, a list of stack, uh, stack frames. Um, every time you call a function, you get a new frame, and there are, uh, uh, you need links in order to know where the, the frame boundaries are in the conventional way. However, if the, in the usual way, those links uh, have potential for stack overflow, and the backlinks can be overwritten by various exploits, leading to return-oriented programming, which um, is, of course, a source of many of the um, the vulnerabilities. In the mill, we actually have two different stacks. The data stack contains the same data as, every, as all thing else. It's got the, the, each function's local data, but there's a separate stack which is managed by the hardware, which is a pure call stack that contains all the return information, and in addition contains the information about how what transits we made going from turf to turf. All of that is often a place where the application cannot get at it, and consequently, return-oriented programming by snack smashing is not possible. And you cannot just go out and overwrite what your turf is. Um, that's in a space that you can't get at. It's inaccessible. All data access is checked against the current turf, which is, of course, in a, uh, a register in the machine. The stack information, that's the secure stack information, is held in what we call spillets. And that's because the uh, portion of the hardware that does the save and restore at call time is called the spiller, because it's spilling state. And you do not have to save your registers. They'll be saved for you. There are no registers, but the rest of your state um, it, it all will be saved for you. And it's saved in one of these spillet structures. Um, you can have as many fr uh, frames in there as the size that the spillet will permit, and you will eventually stack overflow, but when that happens, 
the OS will trap in and you'll get a new spill and allocate it and everything is appropriately linked together. And when you return back out of this thing, everything is unwound for you. The spillets themselves are kept in an array in memory. We reserve a portion of the global address space for spillets, which is a 2D array of these things indexed by turf ID and thread ID. So every time that uh, we uh, um, need to transit through a turf, you wind up in a new spillet located in a different place in the address space. The only, we only need, uh, this 2D array is very sparse, and we only actually have allocated memory for those spillets which are uh, currently active. Um, when you make a portal call, this is our 2D spillet array here. If we are in, running in turf 17 and thread 9 does a portal call, the, such as, for example, that, then we'll wind up a, a, a portal, portal calling into turf 20. And so there's now a separate um, a spillet, which is thread 9 turf 20. And when you eventually return from that, Thread 9, turf 20 goes away, and you're back in thread 9, turf 17. This is supports callbacks and so forth. You can ping pong back and forth between two as needed. So how do you talk across the wall? Well, the usual way that you can pass data back and forth is you can pass it by data value, or you can pass it by reference. Um, I'll explore the by value at first. This appears to be dirt easy. You uh, put all the arguments in your registers and make your call. So if function of x, y, and z is the call, then you stuff the values into the R1 through R3 or whatever the uh, uh, register ABI uses and call the function. But you're now in the call E, and what is in register R4? Well, we didn't, set, we didn't set a value for it, so it's got leftover stuff that was um, it, what it had in the caller. But if you recall, one of the basic precepts here is that you cannot access caller stuff from the callee. This includes perhaps the portion of a security key that happened to have been left by prior execution in a register that did not get clobbered by the call. Um, similar problem with results. If you return a value, you can stuff it in a register. But what is in the rest of the registers? And now the caller can see things that do not, uh, did, uh, do not belong to it, that are leftover rubble, sometimes very interesting leftover rubble, in the other registers. That also is a violation of, I, you can't see it if, uh, I can't see it if you didn't give it to me explicitly. So, what do you do about it? Well, you could say, well, I'll get the compiler to clear all the unused registers. I do compilers, I know better than that. Um, well, the, yes, if you remember to clear the registers, if the compiler remembers to clear the registers and if nothing messes up, well, yes, but don't put your trust in compilers. Trust me, I write compilers. Don't put your trust in compilers. And they will do exactly what you tell them to do, which is, of course, never what you had in mind. So what are we going to do, though? Um, it's not quite so easy and except on a mill, which makes it much easier because the architecture addresses this kind of issue. The mill doesn't use general registers, it uses a data structure called the belt, which is a queue. Every time an operation like an ad computes a new result, that result gets dropped at the front of the queue, and the entire queue is pushed along, and the last item in the queue falls off the belt and disappears and is never seen again. The belt is in hardware. It acts like a glorified shift register, or in fact, it's not implemented that way. There, one of our um, the talks in that list of talks describes in great detail how it works, what it does, what it's good for, and why. 
I'm not going to touch that here, except to uh, walk through a typical call. The arguments are referenced by belt numbers. So this is if we're calling a function func. B1 means the um, where it in in indexes from zero, so this is the second item on the belt. B5 is the sixth item on the belt, and so forth. Um, so these are arguments. You are reading values in the belt. You cannot write to the belt. You can add new things to the front and push it along, but you cannot modify any of it. The dotted line there is a cycle boundary. So when the call er executed the call operation, the following cycle, we're now in the callee. And the callee starts up with an empty belt. If it touches any of this data or attempts to read any of this data, it will fall because there's nothing there. It's not, it does not have leftover register contents. There's nothing there. However, we do need to have the arguments. So the call operation loads the callee's belt with the actual arguments. The callee now does some useful work. And let's say that this is the belt contents that it has at the end of its useful work. And it does a return. One cycle later, and you notice that we have restored the caller's belt exactly as it was at the point of call. The spiller does this. It saves and restores the belt contents. And we have to add a, the new result, which gets dropped onto the front. The belt gets pushed along, and you saw that an item fell off the end. Those two are exactly the same, except for the addition of one additional value. And this works exactly the same way an add operation does, which leaves the belt unchanged except to push something on the front and push, uh, have something fall off the back end. So the call has the effective semantics of an add or any other arithmetic operation. It can also drop multiple results, which is quite handy in some things. Now, in that context, if we want to access the, the data, um, well, the, that mechanism provides everything you need in order to pass arguments by value. Um, the, the only thing that the, the callee gets is the values, which were the explicit arguments that it finds in its belt when it starts up, and vice versa on the way back. Now, if we want to um, if, if the data is in fact in TERF A and we've called TERF B, then it, TERF B can no longer access the data because it doesn't have permissions for it. So we need to pass something by reference. In a typical write syscall, think you have a buffer, let's say that there's a buffer there, and that buffer is described by two arguments which are passed in the belt. Um, the, uh, the address and the size. And the file descriptor is also being passed there. So that there's three arguments that are being passed in uh, the belt. But there's actually a fourth argument as function, namely the buffer itself. Unix does not basically think of that as being an argument. But in terms of the protection environment, it is an argument. It's something that the, you, the caller had that the callee needs to use. And the question is, is, how can it do it? And in particular, how can it do it without being able to access anything else? So the way that works is that the caller call, uses the grant operation to give transient access permissions to the callee. There's the grant. It's got a size and a length saying what is it giving permissions for, what rights are being passed. And this creates a per permission descriptor with the usual address range and rights and other stuff. And that winds up being pushed into a separate place that the hardware can get at, uh, which holds transient permissions. In particular, it winds up being staved on the top of the spiller stack in the spillet uh, that is about to be used. 
the granted permission will let the callee access the buffer. And it does that by putting the, the granted permission on the spiller stack. That is searched every time we make a memory access that we don't f we cannot find the address locally. We search through the the hardware does we as the hardware in this case. Um, we search uh, to see if we have a permission for it. Um, if uh, if we don't find a permission for it in the callee's own stuff in its own turf, then we search these transients and find a, a permission in the transients. So. In order to do all of this, the product of the number of possible turfs and the number of possible threads, which is the bit length of the turf ID and the bit length of the thread ID, and the size of a spillet, reserves 2 to the 50th bytes of the global address space. Fortunately, there's two to the 60th bytes of, the glo of global address space available. So even though you are ad addressing um, that array by turf ID and thread ID, that whole array is occupying only one one thousandth of the available address space uh, on the mill. None of them are physically present unless they are currently active with somebody's uh, actual code using that particular combination of thread ID and um, th uh, turf ID. How that works and how we get away with not having to initialize that uh, with, or not getting the OS involved is the subject of the talk of our memory talk, which is one of the, uh, one of the ones in that list. Returning to the um, a, a problem of, uh, of being able to access the data. Formerly, we were not able to do it, but once we have the permissions appropriately pushed, now it works. And it's as if you had that data to begin with. This permission is transient. The, it is unwound as part of the return operation which is uh, cutting back that stack in the course of cutting back the stack, this automatically makes the permission go away because there's no longer anything you can search at, uh, there. This means in also, in fact, that the transit permission can only be used in the current thread. Even if your process is, has more than one thread and they are running on more than one core, they cannot snoop in their brother threads, brother threads um, a, a data space or stack. Um, so uh, the permissions are granted only to the thread in which the call takes place. Syscalls, well, in the micro uh, kernel model that the uh, mill has been designed for, they're just portals. And you don't have to do the business that is widely used now uh, where there's one syscall and then the syscall uh, then has to um, explode on the other side in order to handle all the different functions. You can instead have just an array of portals that are going to different ones and who in fact may be going to different services um, because they each will contain, each of those portals will contain a particular turf of the um, a service that is handling that particular syscall. So, for example, you can even split it up by file if it works that way. Now, I said that there's a, uh, uh, we support or intend to support the, um, the microthread model. It's perfectly possible to write a Unix or a microthread L4 for, uh, this is, is an example where this has been done and it supports the entire um, application model, um, but is, is uh, still on the inside. It's a microkernel architecture. They've tuned the architecture somewhat. It's now thought that um, it, uh, um, overheads for a microkernel are in the order of 10%. Um, additional overhead compared to the monolithic approach where the OS has got rights to absolutely everything that the device drivers run in the OS uh, ring zero space. 
but 10 percent is too much for many folks and it used to be a higher number and that's no longer necessary here but some of the things that we had to do or that we did in order to obtain extremely high performance interprocess communication run afoul of um, assumptions made in the uh, operating system interfaces that are exposed to applications. I'm going to give you one example here, which is the fork syscall. Um, everybody know what a fork does? Yeah? Okay. Um, I'm not seeing a mass of hands going up, but some find that somewhat surprising. Um, but in any case, um, the fork is uh, the way you make a new process, and it, uh, well, there's a slide on that in a bit. Now, I said that we were able to pass data back and forth without the OS getting involved in translation. And in order to do that, we had to change the basic model of the way the memory hierarchy worked in the architecture. So this is a top-level 40,000-foot uh, view. There's a load store. Um, data side and decode uh, a code side that look quite normal and there are um, top level data and instruction caches and below that there's some number of levels that are shared um, and below that you reach the device controllers and they in turn go to the individual devices uh, such as DRAM or ROM or various other things. This is a rather fairly conventional looking um, top level map except for the fact that there's two instruction caches and there's a whole talk on why there are two instruction caches and how much of a win it is um, that we won't go into here but is available on the site. It's representative. Uh, the individual founding members will vary from this because their founding members are built by specification. Now, not shown in this is translation and the TLB and uh, related hardware. On the mill, the translation is then there, and the TLB hardware lo work, uh, locates there after the caches. Now, that takes care of translation, but we can't have protection after the caches because somebody can stomp on stuff in the caches that doesn't belong to them. So there's a protection look-aside buffer, or PLB, which is in front of the caches. And in fact, there's one on each side, one for data and one for instructions. The, as a result, the mill caches use virtual addressing rather than physical addressing. And the mill has adopted a single address space model in that there is one global uh, virtual address space that everybody shares, operating system and everything else. You do not wind up with each process having its own copy of address hex 530. Um, instead, hex 530 has a global meaning and it means the same thing to everybody. Um, now, the blue, the blue oval there shows you what is actually it, running in virtual using the virtual address space. This shows you what is running in the physical address space, and the TLB is what does the translation in between. Now, this has consequences. There's your traditional memory model. You do a load operation. It goes through the translation protection, which may fault. Uh, then it goes to the caches, and ultimately, uh, the load value will, will uh, get passed back and wind up in the CPU and the registers. On the mill, because all tasks use the same virtual address, there's no aliasing and no translation in front of the caches. So the load goes directly to the cache, which returns the value directly back up to the CPU, to the belt rather than the registers, but effectively the same thing. And in parallel, the PLB is doing protection and can throw a fault, and it's all carefully arranged so that the fault gets thrown before the data gets returned, um, but because it's being done in parallel, rather than having to be done in front like on a TLB, there are um, a, a cost and performance implications because the TLB is a bottleneck on a conventional machine. 
The translation is put in the front because, in fact, it is important back in the days of 16 and 32-bit me uh, memory uh, machines um, that you be able to address address space, uh, alias address space, because there's just not enough addresses to uh, for everybody to have their own. Instead, you have to share them, and that means aliasing, and that means that the translation has to be done before you go to the caches, or alternatively, a task which has to flush all the caches, and some machines did that too, and uh, that w had uh, serious repercussions. On the mill, or excuse me, on this, um, the TLB is on the critical path, um, and the uh, consequently has to be very fast, very expensive in power, and has to be small in order to be fast, which means multi-level TLBs, and the result is that it's not at all uncommon for large programs, especially things like database applications, to spend uh, a significant fraction of their overall time on the banging away on the TLB. On the mill, translation is after the cache, which means TLB is not in the critical path anymore, and it, as a result it can be large, single level, and low power. It also means that we can pass portals, uh, pass pointers between an application and the OS, uh, as for example in the reader write syscall, without having to translate them, because the pointer address means exactly the same thing to the OS as it did to the application. And if you've ever been inside the kernel um, looking at the handling of syscalls, what it has to do is it has to go through and find everything that was a pointer argument and turn it into an OS space address. That is frequently done by reserving half of the address space um, for application addresses um, and uh, th that works fine for uh, it, uh, when the OS uh, is able to see all of the application space, but translation still winds up being called for um, when things are being passed between, uh, uh, not into the OS, but between separate processes. The system vary greatly here because um, a great deal depends on exactly the details of the address translation in units, the MMU and so forth. Just be aware that what I'm giving you is a generalization here, and particular systems do it in very different ways, optimal for themselves. In our case, we just simply pass a pointer, and it means the same thing to everybody. Protection checking is in parallel, as I mentioned. Now, fork creates a child process by carrying the copying the parent. And the internal pointers embedded in the data must still work because we're just copying them as bits. Fork is effectively a bit bucket copy. So if I have a particular object which it, the parent thinks is at address F00, then we just did the bit pointer, a, a, a bit bucket copy, and the, cl the new child is also going to have a pointer value there with F00, except that in the child, it's supposed to refer to the child's copy of the object, not to the parent's copy of the object. These are local pointers. This means that the address in the pointer is local to the process. In addition, the mill has the notion of an external pointer. And these are pointers which refer in both the parent and child with the same bit pattern address, refer to a shared object rather than to uh, the uh, to parent or child's private copy. So for example, if there's some global shared data that you did a memmap shared for, um, or if it's a file that has been memory mapped for uh, where um, that file again has be, been mapped as shared, then that data will be out there in the global shared data space. And when we do a fork, the, we're both now using BAA as an address, but instead of referring to our local copy of the data, we are referring to the shared global data. These are global pointers. The problem is they're just hex numbers. 
How do you tell which is intended to be a global and which is intended to be a local? Which should be using the child's copy and which should be using the, the copy that the parent was using before the fork? And the way you tell, of course, is that the mill pointer is not just a bucket of bits. It's a 64-bit machine. Pointers are not integers. They are 64 bits long, but they are not integers, and they have special semantics. This is the format of it. You've got a 60-bit basic address. Um, but you, most importantly, there's a local bit in it. And that local bit tells the hardware whether it's referring to uh, the local copy of the current process, or more correctly, if we're on the mill space, to the current turf. Um, every time you fork a process, you get a new turf, uh, because that's what Unix means by a process is a thread com combined with an address, uh, a protection environment, which is a turf in mill terms. So if that bit, uh, uh, bit is cleared, then the address is absolute. If it's set, then the address is relative to the turf. As the turf is located in memory, that is all of the local information that just got copied and that it, um, uh, the location of that turf in memory is held in a special register in the hardware. So um, uh, resolving whether think something is local and global is in fact a matter of only a couple of gates in the address arithmetic in the load store units. This addition, three additional bits that are used for bar barrier masks and uh, um, we won't go into what those are for. Because it's not integers, we do have to have special dedicated ops for pointer arithmetic. You cannot say p plus one and uh, uh, use the integer add. You have to use the pointer add, which is a separate instruction or a separate operation on a mill. There is a whole lot more. We also have a mailing list which has um, infrequent things, you, among other things, you'll get announcements uh, for talks like this. And you'll find a vast quantity of documentation and detailed description and, among other things, the, um, released pat the approved patents um, are on our website. There's something like 12 or 15 that have been officially issued and we've got a bunch more um, left uh, that are in, in process at this point. The mill is not a one-trick pony. There are many, many other aspects to it besides this, um, and I encourage you to go take a look. The floor is open for questions. We have one here in front. Uh, so uh, hang on. So the you have a TLB and that maps your 60 bits of address to 32. To a physical address. Your physical memory is. To, to a physical address. And that applies to like DMA hardware as well as. Uh, Absolutely. The TLB is pretty much conventional page translation um, that anyone would, uh, that any machine would have, except it doesn't do protection. Um, a conventional merges translation and protection together and gives you only page granularity for protection. Mill separates the two of them. Protection is at byte granularity. Translation is at page granularity. So, one other question. Does the OS then give these, uh, what do you call the permission pieces? The, uh, the turf? Yeah, the turf. Well, uh, like. Let's say you load a device driver, then the OS has to say, okay, here's your device driver, but you have access to this physical hardware register. The physical hardware is mapped into the address space but, uh, uh, in the configuration, and um, it's standard MMIO, and uh, you, the OS, when it, uh, when it loads the device driver, says, well, you get this for your heap, and this for your stack, and this for your code, and oh, by the way, you get this device over here, too. So does that also apply to the DMA hardware, the peripherals? <laughs> well, that one will take us a long way <laughs> away. <laughs> Fundamentally, the, the mill idea of a device, of an external, a smart external device, we're not talking about a keyboard, 
um, but a smart external device is we see it as being another core. That is, it has, it operates or is seen by the rest of the machine as if it were just another executed core. Um, and it has the same inter-core protections that a, a real core have if you're running a multi-core chip. That, but getting us into multi-core is going to take us a way far afield. Do you have any support for thread cancellation? And what happens if the client process crashes or wants to abort the call because it's taking too long? Um, yes, there is. Um, revoke is a classic problem for all forms of translation. Um, they're the, perhaps the best handled by capability models. We did not, uh, we would like to have had MIL be a capability model, but you can't sell one. Um, because it requires too, too many changes to to uh, programs, um, revoke is does require does um, exist and um, the in fact the revoke is automatic for those transient uh, permissions that I saw uh, that I described. There's also global permissions which um, the portion of the OS that starts a process or for that matter that an application can start the process. Um, and by giving global permissions, which uh, are essentially good until revoked. And if an application crashes, then one of the things that happens in the cleanup, and all OSs have to clean up from application crash, um, and one of the things that it has to do is just as it would go through the TLB and clean its pages out, it has to go through the PLB data structures and clean its permissions out. But if, say, the, the thread that was in the, um, the service, if, say, holding a mutex at the time, right? how do you avoid breaking the service by you know, having, its, um, having the thread go away? Well, uh, there's, again, I, I'm going to get somewhat far afield here. The question is, is who actually owns the mutex? And one of the possibilities is you say the client owns the mutex and passes a reference to it with necessary grants. Another is to say that the mutex is owned by the service and is created by the service and allocated by the service. And the third possibility is the mutex is owned by a mutex manager. And because lots and lots of little, little pieces, each with their own set of mechanisms. And one of the um, possible implementations, remember we don't do policy, we do mechanism, but one of the possible um, uh, uh, implementations is that associated with the mutex is a owner notion that gets notified in some unspecified policy-based way that, um, oh, you just, your thing just died um, and it's now time to run your destructor on it. Um, all of these possibilities are possible within the architecture. We don't dictate where, how it will be done. One of the first things, we are already in the process of getting, bringing up some fairly significant portions of the software um, running in SIM. Um, but uh, one of the first things we intend to do is just simply move a monolithic Unix port over um, it, leaving all of the structure completely untouched, just exactly the standard uh, uh, Linux monolith. But uh, later on, we, ho we hope, we expect that we will also release a, um, a, a, a reference demonstration of, by porting L4 or something similar to, uh, to the mill that actually will use these facilities. A monolithic Unix will pretty much ignore them all. Others? Uh, pardon me, Lance, in my uh, old OS uh, uh, techniques. Uh, there used to be a uh, Solaris doors that took cracks to the same thread, different access privileges between processes. Can you compare that with this? Uh, uh, compare yes. which with what? Solaris doors. Oh, wow. There are, there have been a different, bunch of different operating systems that um, had some notion of, uh, of gate, of portal, we, our term is portals. They're, uh, they, all, they all embed in some way the notion of the ability to 
um, have the caller and callee running in different address spaces or, or different uh, permission spaces. Um, I've used Solaris, but it's been so long that I've completely forgotten it. Um, the portals are our way. Um, the major differences between what we have and all of the ones of similar semantic facilities that I'm, that I'm aware of is the um, mechanism that permits it to be being done entirely in hardware without any trap and um, uh, software intervention at all. And the underlying machinery to support all of that using the Spillet model. It's a um, it's it's more it's a more a matter a difference not of the semantics because the semantics are real easy. I want to be here here and now I want to be there, um, but uh, the actual implementation of that makes it, it is heavily architecture dependent, and we've put a whole lot of work into the architecture to make it work the right way, cheap. There is no trap involved. A portal call is not trap. It is all done in hardware and it takes one cycle. How close is this to being uh, um, on market? Uh, will there be computers using this anytime soon? Um, well, for some value of soon, soon. Um, but um, we, the, the overall mill project is over a decade old. Um, it is a bootstrap project and has been from the beginning. We have been running in SIM now for three or four years. Um, the compiler, which is LLVM based, is struggling to, to its feet. Um, but has reached the point of being vaguely usable, um, enough so that we're seriously, uh, oh, the next thing we got to do is port the damn uh, operating system. Uh, so we're, uh, 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 we're afoot on that. However, the company model is that it's a chip company. And the next real uh, step is that we're going to be um, putting it on uh, out of software sim and into an FPGA. That FPGA will not be a product. It is a proof of principle demonstration primarily for funding reasons. We are right now in the process of putting together our next funding round. Our first funding round was three years ago and the money was spent essentially entirely on lawyers primarily for patents. Um, we've got a bunch of patents. Um, the, next the next funding round will be devoted to getting the FPGA out. Um, with that done, there'll be another funding round, and at that point, we hope to have real, uh, real things with, uh, 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 that, that you can put in a socket and, and away it goes. Um, as with all such developments, um, the magic question of when well, it depends on resources. Um, we're past the point of, of um, research. We're rapidly getting past the point of development. We're now into the process of implementation. And um, well, if I had a better answer, I'd give it to you. But the, uh, uh, as with all things which are going to be actually new and not evolutionary, the answer is it's done when it's done. And every six months or so we go back and look at it and say, is this worth continuing? And every six months ago we, we continue to say so. That's the genesis of these videos and these talks. Um, because we're a bootstrap company, we never had any significant quantity of cash. But we are also old hands. I mean, I've done an operating system. I've done a dozen compilers. And I'm far from the most experienced person on the team. Um, and we're all well aware of the echo chamber effect in the development group. That because you all talk with each other, you think that what you have is absolutely the greatest thing since sliced bread. The trouble is, 
because you're all talking to each other, you're not thinking of the other things on the outside. And we, nearly all of us have been there and realized after we put a ton sl of work in it that we didn't think of these things because we were still only talking to each other. So back when we had the architecture fairly well frozen, we knew we wanted to have an outside voice and an outside set of eyeballs to look at the thing and tell us were we complete idiots or not. Uh, the problem is uh, um, architecture expertise is rare and expensive and we didn't have any money. And so rather than going out and hiring uh, top quality engineering talent to um, look at our stuff and, and uh, give us th their opinion. Instead, we decided, well, we'll file the patents, we'll do the, put the technology in explanatory videos and explanatory slide decks, and we'll dump it on the web. <laughs> and if the, this is called crowdsource QA. Because we all know what the web is like, and if there was any hole in that, it be, the web would be all over it. Okay? That's why we put these out. And if you go back through there, you'll find um, sufficient understanding for somebody who does this kind of work to be able to say, yeah, you know, this is the screwiest thing I ever saw, but it would work, and I could build it. And we get that reaction from the top people in the industry. Um, people who were the lead architects on uh, Intel x86 chips, lead architects on this chip, lead architects on other chips, on, and uh, from academic people and so forth. People who we would never on, uh, ever have been able to hire to, uh, to eyeball it. And they get a hold of us and said, can I help? Very gratifying. Yes, like any development thing, we've torn stuff out. We had great ideas that turned out to be not quite so great. But um, this talk itself is just a continuation of that QA process. By all means, if you see a problem here, sock it to us. And maybe one more question. It's just about 8.30. How does the hardware know when to revoke the transient grants? Or is the grant operation always immediately followed by a call so that the hardware knows when that call returns to revoke that grant? Yes, the transient grants are, auto are always to the next thing you call. Okay. That makes sense. All right, so let's give a good round of applause. <laughs>